we're just sort of flying by the seat of our pants here. <sighs> I, you know, I didn't have anything loaded up. I was in the back of my mind. I'm trying to work through a um, rhyme or something. I just I couldn't get there. Uh-huh. Couldn't get there. It's been a busy day. It has been a busy day. The first thing that we have to talk about, and this is about um, a sort of a uh, a way. A th- something you're always thinking about your training it is a perspective that you need to keep in mind regardless of how much training you've done inside regardless of how much training you've done in different locations for your dog especially at the beginning of your training and even you know as you're working on skills making skills better you have to keep in mind that taking your dog outside taking your dog to a new environment is going to add a layer of difficulty it's going to be a little bit more challenging mm-hmm. because you which you want you know attention and focus or at least checking in on you have to compete with all of the other things in the mm-hmm. world and your dog uh, has evolved to be hypersensitive to those things i mean that's what's kept them alive for so long over years and years and years so they're really good at seeing changes in their environment very aware Absolutely. So, you know, uh, really think about that. So let's say you someone's struggling with their leash walking and um, they, uh, you know, are getting some success in the hallway at home. Maybe they're getting some success in the driveway. How would would they change what they're doing in their training when they go when they get onto the sidewalk when they get to the park yeah definitely i think sometimes people think that just because dogs can do it in one location they can automatically do it in others and uh, what people really need to know about dogs and training dogs is that they're very very situational animals so that means they can learn to do something very very well in one situation And, and by situation i mean it can even be like room to room in the yeah. house versus like the you know inside to outside it can be it can be very specific um they you know they're reading everything so they're very situational and often we suggest with people when they're first um you know going to train something start inside start inside where there's less distractions but then when you do go outside don't just go right for like the full the full goal, you know, maybe it's that you're not just going to walk out the door and like be able to just take your dog magically for a walk. Maybe go outside and start something easy. Will they look at you when you ask them to? Will they respond to their name? Will they sit on a loose leash the first time that you ask? Start with some simple, more simple behaviors um, and test out your dog's listening skills before you take the show on the road. Because if you are standing outside your front door and your dog won't look at you, they won't sit unless you pull on the leash or pull out a treat. Chances are when you take them for a walk around the block, they're going to pull, they're going to get distracted, they're going to pick things up off the ground, they're going to bark at the dog that you walk next uh, next to. Um, so we always suggest that people need to start off close to home and test to see where your dog's listening skills are at. And if you're not getting good focus, that's going to let you know what your next 20 minutes is going to look like. You know, you might spend 20 minutes outside with your dog, but instead of going for that walk around the block, you might spend it just in front of the house working on getting your dog's attention so that, you know, when you go out and do the thing, um, it, it goes better. What you don't want to do is let them rehearse it rehearse doing anything uh, poorly because then that becomes the way that they do it. Yeah, I love that. And I love that way of thinking, Uh, you know, in in terms of like actionable steps, if someone's, let's say you are having some success in your driveway um, where you've gotten to the point where you don't have to keep a treat on your dog's nose the whole time to Mm -hmm. go for walks. You know, you've got time, you've got five, 10 steps, whatever that, whatever the level of accomplishment is, you might need to take one step back when you go to that new environment. The idea of getting attention is so valuable it is something it will change the way your dog trains by just slowing things down for a moment reminding them that you're valuable that that it's worth listening to you can and again it doesn't just have to be treats you know sometimes we'll use toys in our training for some exercises and um you know engaging with them and reminding them like hey even though we're in this new place Tug is just as much fun when you check in with me. Mm-hmm. Tug is just mu- as just much fun when you respond quickly to your name. But you must remember that when you get into this new environment, if it starts to fail, if things start to go wrong, because you're in a new environment, you have to take a step back. Mm-hmm. You know, identify that moment as a training opportunity and take a step back in your training and work on the leash walking, work on the response to name, you know, work on the things that are you find challenging because your dog doesn't know it until they know it 
in this location. Mm -hmm. you, you know, Can I add something? I'd love for you to. Yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, I mentioned before about like asking for a sit or calling your dog's name or whatever, getting for attention. And I think it's really important that when you are trying to get your dog's attention, you keep working at it until you get your dog's attention. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people when they don't know that I'm watching <laughs> and they try to get the dog's attention. They try and say sit. They try and say, look at me. The dog's not paying attention. The dog was just blatantly ignoring them. And they're like, oh, fine. And then they just proceed with doing the thing because they don't want to make the extra effort to like follow through. And then the dog goes, I know if I just ignore long enough, they're going to give up and I'm going to get to pull my way over to grab that stick or check out that dog or whatever it might be. People eventually just give in. So it's really important that you don't through follow through goes such a long way in your relationship and your dog's um, respect for you. And with that comes a dog that is like eager to listen to you. They actually want to do it. The other thing that you want to think about when you're trying to work on getting your dog's attention, especially if you're trying to get a dog not to pull you around on the leash on a tight leash all the time, is when you get them to listen, it's important that you're doing it without pulling the leash and keeping the leash tight. So if you're trying to get them to respond to their name or, or trying to get them to sit, this is a token one. People say sit, the dog doesn't listen and right. they just pull the dog into a sit and then they hold the leash tight and then they say, good dog. Well, you're the one pulling the dog into a sit. The dog's not really sitting, they're just doing it because they happen to be being held into place with a tight leash. So what we want you to think about is you could use the leash to help them get into a sit, especially if they're not listening to you. There is nothing wrong with that. But once they're sitting, Try putting slack in the leash. Try making the leash a little loose for a moment and then see what your dog does because that's going to be the the um, the sign that you have them under control or not. If you tell them to sit, they're not listening, and you use the leash to get them to sit, again, that's okay. And the second you put slack in the leash, your dog just gets up and ignores you. That tells you that you haven't really... You haven't really made the change yet, but if you can say sit, you can put slack in the leash and your dog continues to sit all by themselves and they check in with you. Now you know you've made a bit of a change. That would actually be an awesome time to reward your dog, whether you have um, affection of voice, praise, um, petting, treat, tug, whatever it might be, but that would be a good time to praise. But pay attention to your leash because a lot of the time people just think their dog's listening, but if you actually look closely, they're just pulling their dog around like a puppet and the dog's not actually doing any listening whatsoever. And then you take that same dog off leash and you wonder why they run away or they don't listen. Yeah. It's because they don't have, you know, somebody pulling and dragging them around with the leash anymore. So leashes need to be on because they allow us to have control. But the goal is that the leash is on, but it's not actually being tight on the dog's neck. They are, the leash is loose, the dog's engaged with us. It's really important. Yeah. The other thing I was just thinking as you were mentioning that is how people start to falter when um, they say the command once. So maybe it's their dog's name or maybe it's sit. And then they repeat it over and yep. over and over and over again. And then they say it the 10th time the dog sits and they go, and, oh, good oh, dog. Yeah, he got it. <laughs> Our goal is for you. My goal for you is to have your dog do it the first time every single time. Mm -hmm. That's the level of expectation that we're setting. And if it doesn't happen, then we're going to show you how to how to make that happen. Yeah. But, um, you know, maintain high standards. It was reading, Shannon and I were reading this interesting study talking recently about how, how high expect how important high expectations mm -hmm. are in terms of like authoritative leadership, dog training, how, how important that is and how much more social your dog can be, how much more confident they are, they are yep. the, how much better their problem solving is when you take an authoritative position, uh, you know, when working with them. It's so valuable. And that means things like you go outside, you're making sure that you have clear expectations of your dog. And if it's not quite going to plan, you're taking a step back and making sure you can show them how to be right. Mm -hmm. With that said, <laughs> um, I, we, we have uh, something I wanted to mention. We just got a note from uh, some of our mods that we have a free puppy training seminar ah. it's happening in person this Saturday, April the 6th. At our training facility. At our training facility. I think it's 1 p.m. Yep. Um, I, I pinned it at the top of the uh, chat. If you have a chat open, hopefully it's there. If not, our mods are going to drop it in the, uh, we'll, they'll drop it in the chat and you guys can check it out for sure. Yeah. But, so if um, you're local, this would yeah, be a, a great time to come out and. In person only. See our facility. You get to talk with, directly with the instructors. We can yeah. show you around the facility. Um, this is a special one for in person. So we're not offering it online. This is uh, just for 
face-to-face -face interaction. Yeah, we yeah. need to have a little more of that. Yeah, yeah. So we, we'd love to have you out. And uh, everybody that uh, attends gets a free puppy training gift. Did you know that? I did know that. Yeah. I heard. That's that. that is exciting. Anyway, so if you're local, uh, there's links all over the place. You can go to mccandogs.com. Go to the puppy. Uh, on the first page, you can find there's a puppy seminar thing and sign up for it. It's good it. for if you don't have a puppy yet or if you just have a puppy and you have like yeah. a million and one questions for sure. about what to do. It's for you. Yeah. We talked a moment ago about how using food in your training, the value of it, because it's a resource your dog generally understands. But point number two in getting more focus from your dog when you're outside is that high value food is a powerful tool, mm -hmm. but it won't fix everything. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the situations you've seen with dogs where it's like they're, they're in a situation or a scenario environment where they're like, yep. Yeah, couldn't care less. Yeah. Don't really care about food. Yeah. I mean, every dog has um, a different um, a different level, natural level of motivation by food. And obviously, the dogs that are a little bit more naturally food motivated, they're a little easier to work with in distracting environments if they have a, a lot of love for food. Dogs who are less food motivated, there's actually lots of tricks that you can do to increase their motivation for food. However, I have seen many dogs that love treats, that love food, but they're in a distracting environment where there's a squirrel or there's a deer running or there's like a kid on a bike, bike, bicycle that they want to chase or whatever yeah. it might be. Yeah. And you could, you know, wag the most tasty steak in front of their nose and they just would not care. So, you know, at the end of the day, what we want to do is the food's great, a great motivator. And you'll, you know, if you watch our videos, you know, we do use a lot of food in our training, but we also want to get to the point where the food isn't the only thing that we 100%. have. Sometimes we just have to use um, other tactics in order to affect change. And one of the things that's going to be really important, I kind of mentioned this before, is, um, you know, you need to make sure that you have good equipment on your dog, like you, ha you have a good leash or a long line, whatever it might be, because if you don't have anything attached to your dog to allow you to follow through with things and your dog's just running loose, um, they're going to hear you call them 18 times and they're, yep. they're not going to respond. So it is really, really important. Um, the other thing you need to think about is if you're in a situation where the food is not really a good motivator, perhaps you need to start in an environment, start off in an environment that is not so difficult to compete with in terms of, of the food. So, um, you know, what I want to do is I want to train my dog initially in a more controlled environment so that I can get them doing that behavior really well. So take the recall, for example. So teaching your dog to come when they're called. You know, I'm going to start off, you know, in the house or in the backyard where it's completely controlled and the dog's on a long line. I have all their favorite rewards and I'm building a lot of value for coming towards me so that it's not just the treat that the dog is excited about. It's the actual word come that they love or their name that they love or getting to me and playing that they love. I'm doing it enough that I'm really building a lot of value. And then another thing that we like to do is take that same environment that the dog is totally comfortable in now and make that environment harder so for example maybe i practice a recall and you know i get a family member to bounce a ball over there yeah. or um you know wag a toy or something that's exciting and work on teaching my dog sometimes there's a distraction but you're still going to come we're still going to have fun and i'm going to work through some of that stuff and then from there perhaps i do go out into the world but i might go you know not to the park when you know, the school when all the kids are being let out at, you know, three o'clock, I'm going to go when, you know, it's a Sunday morning or, you know, a time when there's not much going on. So I know that it's going to be fairly quiet and I can ease into those distractions because we have to remember that dogs are, I said this before, dogs are very situational. I can't just go from one situation where the dog is acing it in my house and then expect them to be able to, you know, go for a two hour walk you know, with a bunch of dogs around a park, that's just not going to be a normal progression. So think about your reinforcement that you have, but also think about how that compares to the environment that you're in and is, are you actually ready to conquer that um, distraction um, based on the amount of training that you've done prior? Okay, so pow so important. Um, let's talk about, some people will say like, well, you know, I don't have a family member to bounce a ball or, well, my yeah. dog doesn't care about somebody bouncing a ball. Why what would does they, your dog care about that? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, mm -hmm. why, why would they? Why would they do that training anyway? 
Like, what's the value of the exercise? It's not about bouncing a ball. It's about introducing new distractions. Mm -hmm. It's about challenging your dog and raising that bar bit by bit by mm -hmm. bit just to make it a little bit more challenging. Yeah. So that when the time comes that there's a new distraction that they've never seen before, their tendency is, hey, you know what? I've encountered a bunch of new things multiple times now over the course of my life, mm -hmm. and I've always chosen you. Mm -hmm. um, that's that you want them to default to yeah. you as the decision. I can give you a really simple example of this, and then we do this with all of our puppies. So when we first, when we get a brand new puppy, I spend so much time in the first few weeks teaching them their name, and not just using their name here, there, and everywhere. I teach them that when you hear your name run to me, run to me. It's so much fun. So when we begin, we'll start off with Ken at one end of the hallway, me at the other end of the hallway. We'll both have, you know, a fistful of treats or maybe it's sometimes their breakfast or their dinner. And we'll call the puppy back and forth. All the windows, um, all the windows, all the doors are closed, windows too. Very high floor. Yeah. Um, and so there's the dog really, but puppy can't be wrong. There's really nothing else to do. We'll do that. Once the dog gets the game, then we'll add a little bit of distraction. And then what we'll do is work up into the point where, um, you know, Ken will hold the puppy in one part of our downstairs floor and then I'll go hide. I'll hide somewhere in the down, so the puppy has no idea where I am, and I'll call the puppy's name. And then you can hear the puppy running over here, running over here, running over here. And then when they find me, I throw a huge party, and we play. And the puppy thinks it is the most fun little game. But what starts to happen is I'm challenging their recall. Uh, they can't see me. They can't see that I'm holding treats. They can't see that I'm running away. All they can do is go off of my voice, and that's what I'm trying to work on. But it's a fun little progressional game that the puppies do very, very well at. This is all about building value. I play this same game when you guys don't have an agility arena, but you know I train high-level agility. And before I train my dog to do agility, my puppies spend months doing obedience training in the agility arena. And it's a huge, 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 huge facility with equipment and stuff everywhere. And I put hold, have somebody hold my puppy in one area of the arena and I go hide behind the equipment. I call my puppies. So the same game that we play in the house, I play in different locations. So you could play it. Obviously, it needs to be a safe situation. But play these fun little games that build value so that your dog actually likes to listen to that word. Um, but that's sort of the progression. You can take the same steps the same process and you can apply it to any exercise yeah um drop a like on the video if you've seen our puppy videos especially like our puppy vlogs mm -hmm. where kale and i did we do a lot of these kinds yeah, of activities so many fun games and there's there's a there's a ton of like little things that we it's funny when i look back at them i think like each each every section could be an entire video where mm -hmm. we talk about we could take a deeper dive i mean we love taking deeper dives in the train station our recorded content's pretty vanilla, pretty like short, condensed. You know, it solves one little problem for a very specific dog. But um, we could definitely, uh, you know, draw out a lot more information from things like these fun little games mm -hmm. that build value for you. And don't give your dog the opportunity to fail. Yeah. Really, really important. The other thing we were talking about, uh, uh, oh, I wrote it down, so I want to say it. Uh, Kale is talking about, you know, if the, the environment is overwhelming, your dog's not interested in food, you might need to change the space. And uh, I use the term, if there's too much temptation, change the location. Simply there's that. Your rhyme. Yeah, I know. That's why I wanted to say it. <laughs> um, simply doing that can, you know, bring your dog down to a state of mind where they're willing to take food. And a lot of people say like, oh, my dog doesn't care about food. Well, there could be a whole bunch of reasons why your dog isn't interested mm -hmm. in food. I mean, maybe they're just generally not that food motivated, but it could be. Usually there's a reason. Yeah, it could be. It's a stressful environment. They're stressed for some other reason. They're uh, they, overfed. They're overfed for sure. They're overweight. You know, you've, chosen, yeah. you've chosen the wrong food for this training situation. Not that you're using the, boring food. Yeah. Right, yeah. <laughs> not that food's the only choice. We, we Again, I say, you know, we'll use uh, all, a few other things as well as like pet and praise, you know, uh, toys. We use all Chase. kinds of things. We'll figure out what the dog likes, mm -hmm. and then we'll use that as a reward. But food can be a valuable tool, especially if you're looking for very precise uh, reward positions. Mm -hmm. It's quite valuable. So consider that. Can you just let me know when I can bring Funky in? Yeah, let's go through this really quick. Uh, we just had a super chat from GSD Random. GSD Random ask, what do you guys think about shock collars? Do you want me to take this one? Sure, if you want to. I can bring her in if you want. Um, <coughs> we... Um, we don't use shock collars in our training. 
Um, they're a little bit more aversive um, than we really like to do. Um, you know, there's lots of different ways to train a dog. There's lots of different methods out there to train a dog. Um, you know, we don't we don't use them in our training. We um, try to build a little bit more value for the exercise. Um, we do use some form of corrections with the dogs, um, but we you know believe that it's not necessarily about how firm you do correct. It's about the timing. It's about the communication that's given before and after um, those um, those corrections or re redirections or placements or whatever it might be. Um, but we don't use we don't use shock collars in our training. We also do, do not use any pinch collars in our training. Prong. Um, prong collars. We just don't believe it's necessary to use something that adversive. And again, it's just our opinion. There's lots of different opinions out there, um, but um, it's, yeah, just, it's I, not I, our uh, not our vibe. Yeah, for never sure. has been, never will be. Yeah, no, it, I, um, you know, we actually don't allow those tools on the property. Yeah, but there are way better tools. For like starting with a flat buckle collar mm -hmm. it gives you a good foundation, a good starting point. Mm -hmm. And then if you feel like you have a dog that's really struggling and you can't quite get control and you need power steering, we offer something that's called a gentle leader. It's actually mm -hmm. made by a company. Company, uh, named Pava and um, we get ours custom made directly yeah. from them because this tool is so good the beautiful thing about um, the gentle leader is that it's a tool that uh, gives you a note like muzzle control head control of the dog without being painful or mm -hmm. whatever but the best part about the gentle leader it's not like a halty that slides back and forth you can slip the nose loop of the gentle leader mm -hmm. off and immediately you have a flat buckle collar so for those of you with a dog in training, this is what I loved about it because I would I was able to take you know my as a, as I was learning I was able to take my dog for walks and when we were like far away from people or with less distractions I could slip the nose loop off mm -hmm. and just train her you know I, it's a tool that's built so that you don't have to use the tool anymore and I yeah. love that about the gentle leader yeah so so powerful the goal is to try to work a lot on relationship and and yeah. and build a good understanding and respect between you and the dog so that you don't have to go to something as um, painful as a, as a shot caller in order to get the job done. We're hoping we work out all of that stuff before we would ever need to get to that type of point. Claudia Vogel, super sticker. Thank you for that. Thank you. That's a cute super sticker. And I got to toot. First toot in several live streams. What does it say? My hero. Well, uh, let's celebrate. That's your first uh, super on a live stream. Well, thank you and congratulations on your first super. Um, we have to talk. You talked a little bit about, uh, you know, different things that we'll use to, uh, you know, not only reward the dog, but sort of get their attention naturally. Mm -hmm. We want to tap into some of those dogs that your dog's natural instincts and um, natural behavior so that you're not like working extra hard to try to convince them mm -hmm. that they should listen to you. One of those tools we talked about, food, straightforward. You probably heard it before. Another one that people underutilize so much is motion. Motion. When, when we talked about uh, some of these puppy exercises it, that we do in the house, so we have a brand new puppy, teeny tiny little thing that we want to get the foundational skills and steps uh, with. Um, we use a lot of motion. You know, moving away from your puppy brings them toward you. Calling a puppy down the hall and moving away brings them toward you. And they naturally start to think like, oh, this, this is always good mm -hmm. when I'm moving towards my owner. Valuable, valuable thing. I actually pulled, and I don't quite remember what this is because we, we got into the train mm -hmm. station late, but I pulled a clip uh, that talks about using motion for focus. And uh, I recorded this clip 15 minutes before I Got to the train station. Or I guess I was already here. This, then I cut my what? hair. Then I cut my hair and then, went, then we went oh, on screen. Okay. So pay no attention to the hair. But um, this clip will be valuable for you guys. Let's talk a little bit about how you can use motion in your training. And I think if I remember correctly, this clip. It's a really common challenge that people have. And it makes it more difficult for their pop. This clip might be uh, about walking specifically. We'll talk, okay. We're going to talk about some more exercises though is they don't know what the right pace of walking is. It's pretty easy for you as a handler to get focused on all of the technique when you're teaching this skill. You're, you're trying to keep the leash loose. You're trying to reward in a, in a specific position. You're trying to keep an eye out for uh, all of the distractions in the real world. So it's not uncommon for people to 
really slow down their pace. And the problem is that this actually makes it a lot harder for your puppy. What you need to do is find the right pace and it's not too fast and it's not walking too slow, but it's a pace where your dog's paying a little bit more attention to you. I want you to walk like you're late for something. The great part about this is that your dog finds it motivating and, and, and entertaining if you're walking at a very specific pace and you're way more likely for the next 10 or 15 feet to get that great attention. The other thing it does is it doesn't allow your puppy to uh, discover those things on the ground or be so focused on a leaf that blows by or a car that drives by off in the distance. It, and it allows you to really maintain some of that attention for these short walking sessions. So make sure you pick a good pace. While we're talking about attention and focus, don't be afraid to use turns in your... Okay, we can come back to that. Uh, that you know, that's you. specifically for, yeah, cute dog. Uh, specifically for walking, is, is walking your big struggle? Is that where you are really, um, is that really where you find your dog loses focus the mm -hmm. most? Let us know in the chat. We can talk about that. Um, I want to say something. I was having a conversation with somebody the other day who just got a new puppy and um, they were. Crisscross the arms. Cute. <laughs> um, we were talking about like, um, she had made a comment on a video I had done with five and how fast, how fast five comes to me. Or even like when he brings a toy to me, like how fast he comes to me. And five alive is your? Five alive is my, our youngest dog. So he's, he's two now, but um, he, all his puppy videos are on our channel. You can watch them. Um, but she was commenting on, you know, when you call him, he comes so fast. Or when he brings a, a toy back to you, he comes so fast. Like, how did you get him to do that? And I said to her, oh, I did like so many chase games when he was a puppy. And um, she said, oh, well, I do, I do chase games with my puppy all the time. And I asked her about them. And uh, her version of chase games was that she would chase her puppy. Oh, no. Yeah. So, but it's so funny because in my brain, like, I would just never do that because I just know that it's wrong. But I often... My brain's Forget. different brain. <laughs> yeah. My brain's a dog training brain. Um, so she was like, oh, so she, the, she would chase after the puppy and the puppy would play bound and she'd chase the puppy over here. Um, but then she was also unsure about why the puppy would get to her and then like play bound and run away or it would get the toy and then it would come and like stop and not want to bring it to her. And she didn't realize that all of these like chase games that she was doing the reverse to what we wanted was actually teaching her dog that coming into her was not very valuable. Yeah. So when we say chase games, we mean puppy is chasing you. So you can call them and run away from your puppy. And when they almost catch you, Dee can run the other direction and, you know, do lots of little games. But then remember to let them catch you. Let them catch you and have a little play. Give them a jackpot of treats. Play a game of tug. We do this so much with our puppies. Chase, 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 chase. That it really helps recall. It also really helps walking so yeah. that when you pick up your pace or when you change direction your puppy goes "Woo, I like chasing after you and they want to get nice and close to your side and they want to keep up pace with you when you change direction they want to change with you because from the beginning they've had so much value learning to chase and run after you that it helps a lot of other exercises so and um, it's never too large uh, uh never too late to start these chase games it's never too but, late to stay no, Let's never be too late to start um, but if you do have a, a young puppy, I would highly encourage that you start doing that now. Also, it tires them out. But make sure that it's always puppy chasing you. We never go after puppies because it, it the roles are too inverse. It sort of lets them be in charge of the situation and then we're trying to chase them down. So we're the dog that gets chased is always the leader. <laughs> so if you see yeah. a pack of dogs chasing after a dog, a lot of times people don't realize that the dog who is being chased is the one calling is the, the shots. one calling so the shots. Yeah, Unless yeah. of course the dog's like running away in a different scenario. Life. But yeah, like yeah. when you see yeah. our pack of dogs running in a in a uh, pack, you usually see the poodle out in front. She's right, our little toy yeah. poodle and she's running the show and the border collies are chasing after her and she knows exactly what she is doing. Yeah. Um, so anyways, food for thought there. Well, uh, you know, someone had mentioned in the chat that uh, their real challenge is their dog sniffing all the time, yeah. sniffing the ground because it's 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 a smaller breed dog. Give them a little poke, give them a little leash, uh, leash pop and run the other direction. When they catch you, play with them. So they're sort of go, whoa, there's a party over there. I'm, I'm missing out. I better get there quickly. Also, maintaining a bit faster pace yeah, doesn't allow don't let them, them sniff. Does, yeah, doesn't allow them to get distracted. I, I understand entirely that there's a lot going on when you're first trying to teach your dog to walk on a leash, especially in, you know, 
a new scenario, whether it's outside or your backyard or there's all kinds of things. But, <laughs> and, and so we're thinking about everything. We're thinking about, okay, got to keep a leash loose. Want to maintain connection with my voice, you know, uh, and that you start to slow down. We just naturally forget that we're in the middle of training and like I'm looking around trying to remember all the things. If you keep that pay, pace up, your dog doesn't have an opportunity to get distracted by that stuff on the ground. Um, and I'm not talking like full sprint. You saw in uh, that quick video, we had uh, that dog was named Euchre and Euchre found that vi like too exciting. You know, she lost control. Um, but the right pace, walk like you're, what is it? What is the saying? You're going, you're late like for you're, something. Yeah. Walk like you're late for something. That's a great pace to keep your dog a little bit more attentive to you. Doesn't allow them a lot of time to like, you know, peruse the ground or the sidewalk or whatever. So really use motion to your advantage by uh, keeping the pace up. I'm laughing at the chat because they're talking about who would win in a 40-yard dash, me or you. Oh, it's not even close. And I got several uh, points and then somebody said that you would win. Um, I don't think that people realize that like... I'm a sprinter. You are not a I'm sprinter. I'm a classically trained... Oh my God. You run with your feet out to the side and you have the heavy... He, he runs like an elephant. Like a linebacker. He's, he's built <laughs> and my for carrying hev heavy things, yeah. not for going fast. Yeah. I do think it would be a good race, but I play much dirtier than him. So I would probably like get close and trip him and then keep going. He would never do that to me. Mm, he's far too nice. Yeah. You're like, hmm, interesting. Yes, yes. Good, good. Mm -hmm. I'm planning for that. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. We're going to have to post a 40-yard dash. I don't look dash. fast, but I, I, am, oh, I, am, I am pretty fast. Nowadays, I don't know if my back could take a 40-yard dash. Yeah. Like, I might get into 23 yards and then, you know, probably You know who's faster than both of us? Beeline. Beeline. <laughs> yeah, I Beeline's my border collie who I do agility with, and she is, she is way faster you than You know, us. let's be honest. Kale's a 21-time world champion of dog agility and she gets uncomfortable every time i announce <laughs> I that so this was just an opportunity for me to say that 21 time world champion i'm not even that good at anything and if i were i'd, be, I'd have a flag and a hat and i'd have a t-shirt like no, I'm, you wouldn't. I'm best at whatever the thing is no you wouldn't 21 time world champion but every time i say it she blushes yep okay Talking about Move motion, on. the value of motion. The next thing, and I mentioned just just a moment ago, is your voice. This ah. thing is so important. It's a tool that you have on you all the time. I don't quite understand. Well, I do understand because I was that self-conscious dog owner that felt weird when I started training and, and I... Uh, do you remember when I had to teach you the clap and slap? I do, yeah, yeah, for, yeah, I do. <laughs> but, but specifically with your voice, using your voice, uh, you know... Guys, especially, I don't know why this is the case. When I was teaching a lot of classes, I noticed guys are often more quiet. They, they, mm -hmm. they don't like, they don't want to sound, I don't know, engaging. And it's not about being high and squeaky and bubbly. Although when you see Kale do that, all the dogs in the room are like, what? You know, yeah, I'll like pay attention the, to you. The Pied Piper. Right. That's really what it turns yeah. into. But it's about figuring out what connects with your dog. So, mm -hmm. you know, if it's uh, way to go, buddy. It's all right, that's, It's about your energy. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Using your voice could be the change maker that gets you past that tough distraction or maintain some attention when you're walking by your neighbor's house and the dog's in the backyard. Really keeping your dog engaged with your voice is is it's a bridge it just gives you a little bit uh, stronger uh, relationship bond not relationship a bond with your dog for those moments when you can praise them you know when you can tell them what a great job they're doing maybe sometimes it's to distract them a little bit to just maintain some of some of that focus once they've made the great choice you've used your voice to get a, you know let's say 50 feet instead of 20 on this next training session where you're doing your walking. Once you get that next 50 feet, then maybe you reward them with the thing that they love. Mm -hmm. But that voice is the thing that allows you to space out the treats. You know, it doesn't, we start with a lot mm -hmm. of food, but we're working towards no food and randomly rewarding your dog once in a blue moon because they've done an extra great job. Mm -hmm. Your voice is one of the tools that's going to get you there. It's gonna allow you to make those great strides in your training. But guys, especially, listen to me. Use your voice. Listen Use your me. voice to connect with your dog. It's a powerful tool. We so often guys overlook it. I don't know why. Uh, but even you know, uh, uh, women are the same. I mean, we just don't think. We just maybe we don't understand the value of it. I yeah, don't know what it is. I think sometimes, like I find, sometimes people are like really thinking about what they're supposed to do. Maybe. And when people are like th concentrating on like doing four things at once, they often don't. Um, 
speak at the same time or maybe they don't really know what to say or how to say it's also about like when you use your voice as well the timing in which you use your voice is all really really important but you do want to be engaging with your dog because it does make it a little bit more fun I know like there's times where I'll be training with students and I'll be like holding their dog to do a recall or something and they'll call their dog to come and the dog will be running to their person and I'll be like yay praise that's so good and the dog because I'm loud and energetic the dog will stop and turn around and want to run back to me not because just simply because of the tone of my voice so it is really really important that you learn to use your voice well with your dog because it makes um it makes a a big difference yeah and again you know we're going back to uh something i mentioned earlier you're competing with everything else in the environment Mm -hmm. like it could be sounds it could be smells i mean if you can sound like a squirrel you're set that's right yeah it's going to be helpful for (laughs) sure But these are the things. We're not promoting squirrel sounds here. Whatever connects with your dog. (laughs) The other thing, I guess, to the flip side, we talked a lot, a little bit about leash walking training. But if you have a dog who just doesn't really care, you know, you're you're in an environment where you're trying to get your dog to respond to their name. Uh, Number one, if you've gotten into this situation, your dog's not responding. I sure hope you have a long line on them or a Mm -hmm. leash on them so you can get control quickly. But uh, don't repeat yourself over and over again. The other thing is when we're using our voice. I don't want you to, uh, I want you to set your expectations so high that your dog will respond to sit the same way they'll respond to sit, but not sit. like, not yet. Yeah, yeah. Not like this escalating amount. How often do we see that? You know, when people are like, oh, my dog knows how to do a down or does do something. And it's down, down, down. And then it happens. Hey, down. Right. That, that's and then the dog lies down and you're like, mm. Absolutely. We don't really want to have to yell at the dog in order for it to listen to us. For sure. Yeah. I mean, I mean, it is important. And I want you to, the reason we talk about this is I want you to set, I want to set you up understanding your weaknesses as well as your strengths as you go into the real world and you're trying to get more focus from your dog. Uh Ending your training sessions with a motivated dog. I can't tell you how important this is. You have to experience it. Quit while you're ahead. Yeah. Let's talk about quitting while you're ahead. Uh, And, and, you know, why that's such a valuable thing, especially when it's something like the recall. Yeah. I think sometimes that um, we can do things a little bit too long, especially if if you have a young dog or if you have not even a young dog in terms of age, but just in... You haven't had, um, you haven't done a lot of training with your dog. They don't always start out with these really long attention spans, and sometimes there's actually such thing as training or expecting focus for too long of a period of time right. at yeah. once yep. and you know you have to kind of bank on your dog's natural focus that could be that perhaps you try to train at times where your dog is going to be more focused like not at nap time maybe when they're hungry or whatever it might be used the advantage so that you can get as much bang for your buck as you can um, but it is important that you quit uh, while you're doing something successful so um, and what that sometimes means is that you have to, to change your plan a little bit so um kind of saying use with the recall as an example perhaps you've done a couple recalls and um you know the first part of the recall is going great but maybe your dog's not super focused when they get to you they sit for two seconds and then they want to get up and sniff or they're looking over there um you don't just want to be like whatever and like take the dog into the car um you know practice something that is really easy for your dog to do we always try and say like okay we need a win. How do we get a win here? Yeah. What what can we change so that your dog ends on doing something successful? And the goal is to try to quit before you've lost your dog's focus, before they're mentally tired or before that really tough distraction comes by. I want to try and um, end my training session or quit when things are going well, not when things are going not well. And and you'll learn as you train your dog more what their stamina is like. And, and what's cool is as your dog starts to get more into training, they get more focus on you, they learn more, their stamina gets longer and their ability to focus, it lasts longer. Um, you know, if they start off with a short attention span, it doesn't stay like that forever these are things that improve as your training and your relationship and your dog's listening skills improve Um, but part of it is you needing to be able to read the situation and know whether you're gonna you know push and 
go farther yeah. or whether you're like, mm, you know what? I don't feel like he's not as focused as he was when we first started. Maybe I need to switch to end on something really easy. And sometimes for me, um, I do this in agility training all of the time. It's exi- and I learned this through my obedience training. If I'm working on something really tough and I know I'm ready, getting towards the end of my training session, I would like to end on something that's super easy. And sometimes it has nothing to do with what I'm working on. So for example, if I'm working on like, walking or recalls and I feel my my dog's focus is starting to waver a little bit I might stop and ask my dog to sit and do like three or four tricks change the dog's mind frame a little bit and they're like oh we're doing something different and then I quit so that I I end with the dogs engaged happy looking at me enjoying what they're doing um switching it from something that's maybe a little bit more challenging for my dog to something that I know is dead easy yeah um I've got two points first one I want to say you know, you might be wondering, well, what does that training plan look like? Like, what do these exercises look like? How do I make it a little bit easier? This is exactly, you know, it's tough to communicate a lot of these things on YouTube. We fix specific problems for specific dogs, short periods of time, very vanilla, very or very like standard sort of uh, simple wins. If you need specific help with you, your dog, your specific situation, we do have online training. We do have in-person training. Uh, check out mccandogs.com where it's actually supported by a professional dog trainer. Mm-hmm. You know, a team of incredible trainers that work with people from all over the world to help them to be successful, to guide their training experience. Mm-hmm. So you can definitely check that out. The Life Skills Program for dogs, uh, adult dogs, dogs over four months, and the Puppy Essentials uh, for dogs under four months. Yeah, and if you're going to come to our school in person, we have new sessions starting every month month yeah. um, and if you're too far from us and you want to train online you can start anytime well, there's no specific to start date because t- training your dog is it's it's inherently nuanced you know some of the things will work and some of the things need a little tweak so to get specific information those those things those resources are super valuable I the, do last wanna... thing, the last thing I want to say on that though yeah. is if you guys want a really good tip on training your dog do not wait to start. Oh, 100%. The earlier you start oh, your training with your so with your dog, true. you cannot imagine the difference that it makes. So, of course, there's never too late. You can always teach an old dog new tricks. Yeah. That saying is true. Yeah. But if you have a, a, a young puppy or a dog that's, you know, under a year, really uh, do not wait. People want to wait for the dog to grow up or they want to wait for this. Don't wait. Yeah. Get into training. I cannot tell you how much e- e- it, it easier it is to start yeah. the training programs when they're young so that we can stop bad things from happening in the first place. So that's my advice to you. Do not wait. Start immediately. Yeah. It, oh it's, it's, my gosh, it, it makes your life me. so much easier. It's uh this is a use mistake. it for I mean, he's this an is, example. This is a mistake <laughs> I made for sure. And you know, I I, I um I encourage students to do the same thing. But uh, it's the ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You know, the simple choices you make early on uh, yeah. will make a massive difference for yeah. your dog. But I do want to say, you know, we were talking a little bit about uh, ending every training session with a win and people are probably, th- I know you might be thinking, well, how long should I train for mm-hmm. then? Like, how can I plan ahead so that I'm making good choices? Here's a quick hack. Break down whatever amount of time you have in, uh, for training sessions throughout the day. Like, you know, maybe, I don't know how organized you are. I'm not this organized, but our, our <laughs> trainers do this a lot. They'll block out, you know, time and, you know, when can I train? How much time do I have left over in the day? Break that up into small pieces. So you train for five minutes, you know, when you go for potty in the morning. You train for a couple of minutes with your dog's food, with their meal. You train for 15 minutes whenever you get home from work. And then you train for 20 minutes in, after dinner when you have a little bit more time. Shortening mm-hmm. those training, training sessions. Make sure that you have a refreshed, motivated dog that's ready to listen and learn. And this is how you can make sure that, you know, at least you know you've got enough gas in the tank. To Kale's point, ending with a motivated dog, ending on a win, you know, maybe if you're struggling with an exercise, doesn't matter what it is, then all you need to do is get a win on a get in at your side or get a win with your dog sitting and a distraction goes by, a win with your dog in a sit stay and you're clapping your hands. It Mm -hmm. doesn't matter what it is, but ending on that win is a really great tool or is a really great um, way to make sure that like... Your training, it's, it's the last impression is a lasting impression mm-hmm. for your dog. And I want you to think about that. You know, what, how, how did we end? The other thing you do need to be mindful of, and we talk a lot about this with, talk a lot about this with our students, is um, you are a big part of the equation. So it's, there are some days when you're mm-hmm. like, boy, I'm tired. Boy, this is <laughs> not going great. I'm not in the right headspace to train right now. Mm-hmm. And that's okay. 
you know, you need to take care of you first. Also, you might not be giving those dogs the best information if you're just not feeling it, if you're extra tired, if you're extra sick, whatever might be going on. So make sure you're bringing the most you you can to your training sessions. It's, it's going to be really helpful. And you'll know, you know, you'll know when you feel yeah. like training. You know, there are some days when you just don't train after nope. classes. I just try and do something brainless, like play tug or throw the holy roller down the hallway a couple times. <laughs> Lots of links, Luton. What puppies learn first, they learn best. Yeah, that's probably something we've mentioned in 50 of our videos. Yeah. But it's also... I love it. Yeah, I love it. Absolutely. It's so much easier to... Uh, you know, give the puppy the greatest. Get that on a puppy front. essentials T-shirt. We talk a little bit about using toys in training. Um, why toys are valuable? Why might you choose a toy as a reward instead of uh, treats in training? Uh, well, there's some dogs that aren't as uh, motivated by treats. We we trained a border collie that wasn't as motivated by treats, but um, there are certain exercises that um, I will train with a puppy that I actually prefer using a toy instead yeah. of food. Yes. Um, one, I think sometimes it gets um, a more animated response from the dog. Um, it allows like a little bit of longer engagement between me and the puppy. It allows me to play and get my hands on them. And, you know, I like to playfully, I was joking before about the clap and the slap. That's, um, you know, a fun little game when we're tugging. We like to tug and then we'll like tickle the puppy's side or push them away and just playful little engagements that make the puppy like really want to, you know, get into the play. Um, so it's a fun thing to do. But typically, if I'm going to use a toy to reward my dog for things, I will use them for exercises that are already active. So things like response to name, um, recalls, um, chase games, things where the dog's in motion. I would not use a toy for things like lying calmly on their bed or sit stays or things like that where I want the dog to be a bit bit more mindful and thoughtful and I want the dog to sort of be in a stationary position as they're being rewarded. Um, I also don't always use uh, toys for like walking, for example, because when you're trying to play tug with the dog, it's hard for them to hold heel position at your left hand side. So I pick and choose the types of um, behaviors that I use for a toy. But I think it also makes the training session a bit more interesting so that, you know, when I train things with my dog or I am doing a specific training session, I try to do a few different things where I can use different types of rewards because it keeps, it sort of replenishes the dog's attention a little bit. Um, I've also trained lots of different breeds. We have a toy poodle, a hippie shake. She's 10 years old now, but when she was a puppy and we were training her she has this tiny little belly and you know if I would train her for 15-20 minutes she would be completely full and then I couldn't use the treats anymore so I had to be a bit creative about okay what exercises do I want to use food for here yeah. and what exercises do I not because if I'm trying to make you know going to an hour-long obedience class I had to be thoughtful and intentional about how I was using food and how I was using the rewards because she literally would get full. Yeah. Um, so every dog is a bit different and um, you kind of want to be able to pull from uh, all of these different options to rewards, but toys are such a great way to do it. And if your dog has natural toy drive, that's awesome. If they don't, you can train that in your dog. And yeah. in my opinion, it's really, really worth doing it. Um, you know, a dog that learns to play retrieve is a dog that is going to be healthier overall. You can play fetch, you know, every day to keep your dog in shape. It's way healthier for them than... Um, you know, taking them for a walk. If you go for a walk and then you play fetch, you know, oh, once a day, totally. it, it helps their heart. It builds muscle. It's it's so helpful. It tires them out. They can come inside and nap. Um, playing fetch is so important. But sometimes if like some people will shake a toy in front of the dog's nose, the dog's like, man, they go, oh, well, they don't like toys. Yeah. And then they just write it off completely. Um, but you can work at it and really teach the dog um, that it's a fun thing. And in my opinion, it's really, really worth the time to do that. So, so yeah, and when you're outside, when you're trying to build focus with your dog, I mean, there is no better way than playing a game of tug. Oh, so fun. Like, you know, if you're in your backyard, you have your dog on a line and you're 
ending your response to name with getting to you and playing tug. Mm -hmm. Like what a powerful relationship yeah. building opportunity that is to remind your dog that, hey buddy, we're at the park, but the best thing that can happen today is that we get to play this game. Mm -hmm. And it only happens between you and yeah. I. Like that's the thing I learned about tug. I, I am so um, high on the tug idea of using tug to build a relationship quickly. Yeah. Because number one, you gotta work on your out exercise, great leadership. Number two, you can burn off a bunch of energy very quickly. You can number teach him about manners, not you, grabbing it. Absolutely. Before you say so. A little bit of mindfulness and self-control. Mm -hmm. And number three, the uh, it's all about you. The only way this thing is valuable is because you're on the end of it. Mm -hmm. And when it when you're talking about trying to get your dog's focus in a new environment or you know uh, practicing these things, yep. so your dog defaults to you naturally. A tug toy and a response to name is an amazing way to do that. Yeah. If you have five minutes tomorrow uh, and you go home for lunch, let's say, and uh, you know a couple minutes you want to do something with your dog, maybe you're work from home, whatever, go outside and play tug with them. Go out in your backyard, and play tug with them, and watch how well it works when you go back, uh, you know, to your office or when you, you you know they go down, go inside and lie down, and then the next time you go outside, they sniff the grass a bit and they check in with you because they're like, hey, remember mm. the last time we were outside? You had something great. I, I, how um, how are we doing for uh, puppy tugs right now? I don't know. Oh. Oh, boy. <laughs> I'm going to so, tell you about a game that we play, and then you're all going to race to get puppy tugs. I, I hope know, we have I enough for you. You guys might buy them out. I'm not yeah. sure. I don't know what So to one of our favorite games to play with tug are restraint recalls, and we do this with all of our young dogs, like, up until they're like a year old. And sometimes we still do it now if we yeah. want to tire them out a little bit. Yeah. So we have, a, we call them puppy tugs and they are like four feet long. And, and the length is important here because what we have one person do, and you can do this with one person if you don't have a, a helper as well. But ideally you can get the family members involved, um, have somebody hold the puppy, the person who's holding onto the four foot tug toy, it's long and skinny and very soft uh, to get their mouth around. So it's very encouraging, very rewarding to grab. You dangle the tug in front of the puppy's nose and then you take off and run, hoot and holler, call their name, and then person who's holding their puppy lets go of the pup yeah. and lets them chase after. And once they get to you, you let yeah. them grab onto the tug. By, by having a four-foot tug, it can actually kind of drag on the ground yeah. a little bit behind the person and that en encourages chase drive. It also ensures that your puppy doesn't nip you because they can bite an end that's much farther away from your hand, which is why it's so great for puppies. So... Favorite oh, puppy toy. Totally. We we shot a video with that. Um, I forget what the puppy's name was, but it was that night in uh, at the Percy. training facility. Percy. And watching that puppy, who has no relationship with Kale at this point. He was en en amazing. Engage with that tug toy in a brand new environment when all he wants to do is roll around and chew, chew on the leaves and sniff yeah. the corners of the fenced area. That's the kind of stuff we're talking about. Yeah. That's the kind of exercise you should be doing with your dog. Those are the kinds of relationship building activities that you need to focus on regardless of where you are in your training journey. Mm -hmm. This is the stuff that completely turned around my, my understanding of dog training and it really made it fun. Mm -hmm. You know, it just brings fun to training. And the best part is it doesn't ever feel like training. Yeah. It's fun for you, fun for the dog. And then you go back inside, so fun. you put your feet up, watch Netflix and your pup just wants to sleep. They're like, like oh, that, I'm so tired. Isn't that how you imagine dog ownership at some point? Or they can go and sleep peacefully I know in their crate without barking. Absolutely. Yeah. Totally. So, you know, these are the things you can do to get better focus from your dog. And it doesn't have to be work and it doesn't have to be complicated. And it, it doesn't really need to involve a specific tool all the time. There's all sorts of strategies talking about Understanding that being outside adds a layer of difficulty. High value food, whatever it is, whatever you think it is, might not always work and what you have to do to sort that out with your dog. Using motion, valuable tool. Using your voice, always with you. It's something that you can use to get your dog's attention anywhere, but use it correctly. And ending your training sessions with a win. Maybe it's a game uh, of restrained recall mm -hmm. with, with a puppy tug or fuzzy ball tug or something like that that your dog just finds super engaging. Fuzzy ball and, tug. That's oh, yeah. Five's favorite. Uh, oh, absolutely. Yeah, so those are great toys. These are the things that I want you to think about when you're figuring out your next training session outside with your dog to get more focused so that they're naturally choosing you. Um, uh, Dan, lots of links. I guess you should play with while the pup is on leash if it's in a public park. Mm, absolutely, question. yeah. Yeah. What? Get yourself a long line, um, Natalia. Uh, get yourself a long line, so like a 20-foot line um, so that your puppy has a bit of space to run around but that you can either attach it to your belt or you can hold it in your hand. That way your dog has 
has a little bit of freedom to run and play, but then of course, until they have a really reliable recall or perhaps you're somewhere where your dog's not allowed to be off leash, it does give them a chance to uh, run and play, but you still have control. Absolutely. Huge thank you to all of our moderators tonight. Thank you to everyone who dropped a super chat or super sticker. Thank you to you. If you have a dog who is distracted by the noises outside. If you're, we had an issue when we were traveling when uh, there's lots of noise. We're in a new environment. It was a little unsettling for the dogs and we started to use music. That was such a good experience for mm-hmm. the dog that needed it that we started working with music content creators. They develop music that's specifically for the dog with the right tones to fill, fill your environment, with the right pace so that it's a relaxing uh, uh, beats per minute and uh, we offer all of that on the McCann Dogs music channel at the end of tonight's show uh, it's going to tell you that you can go over there and check it out that music is also available on Spotify mm-hmm. and Apple Music super valuable thing if you're working on crate training working on you know if you leave your dog throughout the day for any length of time pop on McCann Dogs music to have a more rested experience now with all of the teaching all of the training all of the things that we've talked about tonight the rest of our friends will let is up to you.